welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I am recording here at my house in Newport Beach. Uh, kind of bunch of things going on this weekend, but um, really actually excited about, about this week's Dividend Cafe. The, the message from it, the content from it, is something that I think a lot of people are asking about. I'm looking forward to talking to you about that here now on the, on the podcast and, and the video. And then as always, I would love for you to go to dividendcafe.com where there's, you know, a little bit more elaborate written commentary. But the subject is this whole concept of a bubble and, and excess and, 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 you know, the risk of, of things being in this really frothy period of time. And I, I want to first start with an observation that I think is fascinating. Um, I'm sitting here recording, going into the last weekend of March of 2021. And one year ago, in the last weekend of March 2020, all of the questions, all of the punditry, all of the commentary, all of the conversation was totally understandably around how low are we going to go? How bad is it going to get? how many millions of people are going to die, hospitals overrun, the length and severity of a lockdown, questions about what the economic contraction would look like, are people ever going to fly again, are businesses ever going to you know, open again. There was this peak level of where we were a year ago of uncertainty. And as markets in this week that we just got done memorializing, hit their bottom through that period, there was an exorbitant amount of discussion as to retesting the lows, breaking through to new lows, lower than even that 18,300-ish figure that we had hit on March 23rd. And so all of those things at the time, contextually, there were a lot of people that were wrong, those that predicted we were going to go all the way to 15,000 and 10,000 or whatever didn't didn't happen. And there's a whole lot of reasons. And, and I don't have any problem with that. That's the way the world works, that when the facts change, people's opinions change. I, I say it to highlight the contrast of right now, all of the discussion and, and the sort of um, context is in language about a bubble, about uh, uh, mania, uh, how high are we going to go? How blown out is this going to get? Is, is such and such electric car company going to 4,000? Is such and such a cryptocurrency going to 100,000? Is the NASDAQ doing this? Is FANG doing that? So, so everything is just a polar opposite. It isn't just, and this is profound and interesting enough, it isn't just that a year ago we were all looking at this and then now we're in a different season. It's that we're in this polar opposite, the hyper fear has now been replaced by a hyper emotion in a completely opposite direction and category. And some of that, I suppose, is prima facie reasonable. Most of it, I actually think from the punditry class, is just a weather person changing the sensationalism of their, of their view, um, the, calling for extreme cold and then calling for extreme hot, you know, the point, the key word is not cold and it's not hot, it's extreme, right? And that's, I think, where the way a lot of people sort of uh, get their clicks and get their, uh, uh, drive their, their kind of business model. But it, it, my view here is a lot of things happened. Um, a lot of them are really positive. A lot of them maybe are short-term positive, long-term negative. But, you know, when you look at at where we were and where, how we've come out of it. I talked a bit about that last week, some of the fundamentals. Um, look, I think that the, the assist that the Fed gave into corporate credit alone and its bleed through benefits into equity markets, that alone was a very significant market impacting event. The fact that hospitals never got near overrun, the fact that the um, disease proved actually to be even more infectious than people thought, but far, far, far less fatal than, than people thought. There's just a whole lot of things that we didn't know a year ago. We know now some of them medical, some of them political, 
some of them economic, some of them monetary, but, but those things now are, are able to be better priced in. So then when the conversation turns to, are we in a bubble? I think that we use language ambiguously and I don't wanna do it. I want clarity. I want specificity in the way I'm talking to my clients, okay? And I'm very much on the record about certain segments of the investment universe that I think are overpriced, but I wanna provide a couple categories for you to help think differently about what might be overpriced, what might be stretched in valuation, what might be expensive, what might be ill-advised to be invested in versus a bubble. Because I don't think it's mere semantics. I think it's paradigmatic and I wanna drive this contrast for you. As a general rule, and this is not necessarily universal, but I think this is useful. I think that overpriced investments or expensive investments or, uh, or ill-advised investments are paid for, okay? You have cash and you pay a hundred bucks for something and it goes to $50. You have equity and that equity value has dropped. When you start talking about bubbles, you almost inevitably have talked about debt. Something has been funded, we've borrowed money. And, and when you say, well, no, look, everyone loves this kind of overpriced stuff at 100, now it's dropping to 50, and the masses have come in. And so there's still a bubble and there's still a lot of losses, and yet that was equity funded, not debt funded. The thing you miss is that along the way, you said the masses come in. The masses do not come in with their own money. The masses always come in with borrowed money. That could be hedge funds, it could be institutional, it could be, it could be banks levering up their balance sheets in some cases when you talk about like the dot-com or retail crazes and the flipping of Las Vegas condos and whatnot, it's always debt field. I, I, guess, I guess the point I'm making is that the, a, a characteristic, a hallmark of a bubble is the way in which it's financed. And the reason for that is that there's a very, very, very low limit to loss when things are equity funded. It can be brutal. Some of is 100%. But it is not systemic. It's isolated to the holder of the investment. It drops in value. They've lost that money. Where debt fueled investment now leads to losses both for the investor and for the lender. There's leverage on it. So losses are multiplied. They're more than one to one. And the nature of debt fueled investment means that there's very likely a whole lot more people that came in. So the loss is, is exponential and then systemic. It bleeds into other things because what starts as a loss in one area when it's filled with debt means another asset has to be sold to clear that debit, to, de to, to, to liquidate that debt. And therefore it puts selling pressure on other aspects. So there's a systemic nature to um, debt field bubbles which is just categorically different than the isolated losses of someone who may make a bad investment, who may have overpaid for something. And, and also a bad investment that might really be an early investment. They overpaid and maybe it works out later through time, but when it's debt field, you're never gonna know that because the, the debt takes you out of the investment before the payoff that might come later. The other category that I want people to think about is a bubble in a productive asset versus a non-productive asset. A railroad or broadband can be a bubble if, they're, if all of a sudden all the hallmarks of overvaluation and excess and euphoria are there, but the underlying asset provides a utility to the economy. It provides some sort of productive benefit and, and it has a... a um, a role in the supply chain, if you will, of the economy, where a bubble in a non-productive asset um, has no such thing. And, and I don't know if crypto fits into this category or not. And, and back in the old days, there were plenty of dot-coms that clearly fit into it. The point being that ha that distinction between a productive and non-productive asset um, is almost a categorical distinction and the way that a bubble might impact capital markets and the economy. And so I think that 
right now, we are dealing with a whole lot of questions about a bubble um, because we have some things in, in risk assets that feel and seem, and in some cases most certainly are overpriced. You have an awful lot of liquidity sloshing around the economy. You have a very low cost of capital. You have um, incentives to lever up, to borrow, to invest you, because of low cost of capital. Uh, because of a low available return on capital through treasury bonds, municipal bonds, safe assets, things like that. So there is a, a kind of um, paradigm in which, you know, there, there is a propensity for excessive valuation. Do I think some of the micro cap tech stuff has gotten expensive? Of course. Do I think FANG got expensive? I do. I, I think that all those things I've talked about are true. But this is a distinction I want to make between the possibility of overvaluation and the possibility of a bubble. I actually think that we're wiser to define a bubble in terms of a cultural context than an economic one. Having gone through the bubble that was technology and dot-com in 1999 that burst in 2000, and the bubble that was the housing crisis, which was the mother of all bubbles, I didn't live through it or invest through it, but the bubble of Japan in the late 80s, which I've studied immensely, this was a period of rank non-discrimination across risk reward uh, decision making. It was a period of, of silliness that was defined by apathy about risk, about fundamentals, about math, about logic, about economics, about truth. And so you got to this point, you have celebrities doing commercials for, for the E-Trade stuff at the Super Bowls and things in the late 90s. And, and it, it was um, a craze. It was a mania. It was debt field. It was irrational. It also felt so good when it was going on. Well, I think that there's pockets of overvaluation right now, but I really think that there's as much fear of a bubble or more fear of a bubble right now than there are signs of a bubble. And that's a hallmark definition of not being in a bubble. The point of a bubble is when all of a sudden everyone is just positive that you can buy five condos in Florida with no money down and nothing can ever go wrong. Well, that's a bubble. There was a complacency that was systemic, cultural, in the housing crisis and the technology boom. Um, I don't think we're experiencing that right now. I think we're experiencing pockets of overvaluation to the extent that all asset classes are somewhat frothy in valuation. That is at very different degrees. No one could look at the consumer staple sector and FANG and say that they're equally overvalued relative to historical valuation. But I think that to the extent that there is a kind of macro high level of valuation, it is um, part and parcel of the monetary environment we're in, where there is a 0% reference rate in the risk-free, that all assets are priced against something that is so low that is boosted valuations across the board. So once you kind of deal with the rising tide nature of everything, then within that, you have to be discerning. And you have to look at certain sectors from the SPACs to the crypto, to the micro cap, to the, to the technology, to whatever else. Look at those things, individual sectors, individual companies make those decisions. But I don't think it's useful to look at this binary as everything's in a bubble or, or, or nothing's in a bubble. I think that we have a valuation conversation that's always and forever important for investors, but that cultural marker of a bubble, which, which I personally have lived through and invested through twice, is, and that we have experienced as a society countless times going back historically, I think that that's a different marker than what we're experiencing now. And I hope that distinction is helpful. All that could change. There could end up being a real debt field craze. There could be a lot of non-productive assets that get bid up and there could come a point and there's indications of some leaning in these directions. But by and large, I'm trying to make these distinctions for clients uh, to help make discernments across um, asset classes and securities and sectors 
that uh, look at, uh, potentially overvalued versus ones that don't, and yet by all means avoiding the cultural moment of a bubble. I hope it's useful. I thank you for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Uh, that offer continues on the table. Anyone who wants to write a review of us, as bad as you want the review to be or as good as the review, send us a note that you did so, and we will send you a copy of my book, The Case for Dividend Growth, um, which remains from the very moment I submitted it to the publisher, uh, something I believe in uh, every jot and tittle of the 192-page book. Uh, about investing. And, and as we come out of this COVID moment and go into the next year, I believe it just as much as I did pre-COVID, during COVID, and when I wrote it and all those good things. So I'd love to send you a copy of the book if you're interested. I'd love for you to review. I'd love for you to subscribe to the podcast. And I'd love to quit talking now. Thanks for listening to the Dividend Cafe.